We're going to go to chapter one of Song of Solomon. Uh, starts early on with a little dialogue back and forth between Solomon and a woman. And this woman, we will later find out, was the uh, love of his life. Now, you and I know that so Solomon had a lot of wives and concubines. Uh, in fact, that got him in trouble eventually. But uh, one of the things that we have to understand is we live in a very different culture than what he did. And as you increased your land and uh, took over nations or made alliances with nations, uh, he was almost required to marry someone from that particular nation so you'd never go to war against them. So uh, he accumulated a lot of wives because he accumulated a lot of land and a lot of territories and kingdoms. So uh, those women were not what I call his true loves. But this girl, whoever this girl was, uh, was the uh, love of his life. And she says uh, very early on in chapter one, tell me you whom I love, where do you graze your flock and where do you rest at midday? Uh, and the friends are going to sing at the very bottom of this slide. It says, follow the tracks of the sheep. If you were to imagine uh, this to be like a musical, and she asked this question, you would hear the little friends of, of him sing, or her sing, follow the tracks of the sheep, follow the tracks of the sheep, because that's where he was going to be. He was going to be out around his flocks and taking care and watching over his resources that uh, he had gathered. Now, uh, there was a principle that you may not uh, understand or know about, but the, the loose women of the world, and even those of, in poverty, would hang out and look for the scraps of uh, the grain uh, fields and, and others. And so when she says, why would I be like a veiled woman beside the flock of your friends? Uh, she is trying to say something, and it's a pretty significant uh, revelation. And it, and what she is saying is, I'm not going to be like one of those loose women or one of these desperate women that's just going to hang out looking for scraps from you. I am a person of character and I would not be like them. I would not lower my standards in order to meet even King Solomon. Um, I just tell something initially about uh, the intensity of her character. Uh, she would not compromise herself in order to meet even King Solomon. Uh, there is a, a thing that's gone on throughout history. It's called, uh, uh, during wars, even the Civil War, there would be prostitutes with, that would follow the armies all around the country. Wherever they went to battle, there would be uh, prostitutes and, and uh, people around them to take care of the soldiers' sexual needs uh, through this time. And there was actually a general... Uh, in the army, and his name was General Hooker. And so it wasn't too long before they didn't call them prostitutes. They began to call the women of the night hookers that uh, were hanging out with General Hooker's troops. And you see, of course, we've had several other names to designate prostitutes. But uh, this woman said, not going to go hang out. But she wanted to be with him. She wanted to hang out with him. Now, I told you earlier in the semester, I would tell you one of the greatest love stories of all time. It was uh, had a whole issue of ACU Today dedicated to the love life and romance of my relationship with my wife, who I met here at ACU. If you look in the top right corner, that's our picture. And as you can tell from the bottom left corner, we have hardly changed at all. <laughs> um, that was uh, us as freshmen, and uh, believe it or not, that girl uh, grew up in Lubbock, Texas. I grew up in Dallas. My youth minister in junior high was a guy named John Paul. And uh, her youth minister was also John Paul, but he uh, was her youth minister when she was in senior high. So he both knew us. Uh, he knew both of us. And he was telling me, there's this girl you need to meet named Jenny Lynn uh, from Lubbock, Texas. And I didn't realize it, but he was telling her the same thing. And he was telling us we should get married because he was just convinced we were the perfect little couple. Uh, he knew I was wanting to be a youth minister. Uh, he knew she wanted to be a youth minister's wife someday. And so he had told us those things. So when I got to ACU, I kind of had that in the back of my head. And I thought, I'm going to try to find this girl named Jenny Lynn, see if she's 
uh, anything special. Well, they had a deal back in that day. That's kind of like our welcome week uh, of a actual picture book of every single freshman uh, who was coming into ACU. And I looked and I looked and I looked and I kept meeting all sorts of people who were uh, from all sorts of areas, but I never could meet this girl named Jenny. In fact, it became really funny because I would ask people, hey, have you seen Jenny? Yeah, she was just here like three minutes ago. You just missed her. And I'd get to chapel. Hey, have you seen a Jenny? No, I didn't see her. Well, yeah, actually I did. I saw her. She was over the campus center right before you got here. Well, I had just been at the campus center myself. So uh, it became almost an obsession to find this girl. Finally, I met the Highland Church of Christ one Sunday morning, and this is about four or five weeks into school, still hadn't met the girl. And I saw this girl from Lubbock, and her name was Mary, and Mary introduced me to all her friends. And she said, here's my friend this, 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 this. And at the very end of the line, she said, and here's my friend Jenny Lynn. And I went, oh. And so I ran down there to finally meet this girl, and I met her, and I made the stupid decision to say, Hey, I heard John Paul thinks we need to get married. My first meeting, which that was stupid. Don't do this. Y'all take a note. Do not ever do this, guys. Well, she didn't want me to think that she was interested in getting married off just his uh, recommendation. So all of a sudden, now I started to bump into her and see her at school. But every time I saw her, got within 100 feet of her, she took off the other direction. I would see her at Walmart. She took off the other direction. She'd go to aisle three. I'd go to aisle three. She'd go to aisle 10. I'd go to aisle 10. She'd go to aisle four. It was horrible. And uh, she was running, 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 running away from me. Uh, this brought out the hunter instinct in me. And so I was trying to just get close to her so I could get to know her, but it was not working well. Finally, one day, and you see the picture at the bottom corner, we were having a watermelon uh, mixer for the freshmen. And it was right over there in front of McKenzie Dorm at the time. Uh, so I saw her kind of disengaging from somebody and I can tell the conversation is about to end and I kind of snuck up on her. Some, I guess some people may say I've been stalking her. Okay, yes, if they had that charge back in that day and the time, I would have been arrested. But I waited and as that person left and she started to turn toward me, I stepped on her foot and I said, hey, I'd really like to get to know you if you'll just sit still for just a little bit. She looks at me and says, get off my foot. I went, yes, ma'am. And so she did go out with me that night. And everything was uh, really good. Had a great talk, great visit. She seemed like a really neat girl uh, in a lot of ways. Unfortunately for me, uh, at that time, this little cute sophomore girl decided she was interested in, in me named Julie. And so Julie and I kind of went off and... and kind of got into a relationship together for the rest of my freshman year. Uh, at, toward the end of that freshman year, we finally kind of broke it off, went our different ways, and I started thinking, I need to circle back to that girl named Jenny. And, of course, the rest is history that we did get back together. Uh, and that picture is commemorating, of course, that first meeting, but uh, the most romantic part is as we were walking across campus one night toward uh, the beginning of our senior year here at ACU, I took her to the exact same spot, and I told her, do you remember this place? She said, yes. And I said, you remember me stepping on your foot? She said, yes. And I stepped on her toe very gently this time, and I got down on one knee, and I proposed to her on that very same spot and told her that she had told me yes last time for a little date to start getting to know each other, and I hoped that she would spend the rest of her life with me. Uh, and by saying yes, and popped open that ring, and all that jazz. So... Anyway, that's, that's the uh, short version of it, uh, if you call that short. Anyway, one of the things that I had to do was get in proximity. That's exactly what this woman did. And they began a series of what I call flirtations. Later in chapter one, uh, he says, How beautiful you are, my darling, your eyes are doves. Uh, she says back to him, How handsome you are, my lover, how charming. He says back to her, The beams of our house will be cedars. In other words, uh, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to, I got money. Uh, I've, I, there's going to be strength in our relationship. She says, I'm a rose of Sharon. He says back to her, you're not just a rose. You're like a lily among thorns. That's, that's how I see you. So 
every other girl in his kingdom, all the other girls that would love to be the King Solomon's uh, girlfriend, wife, he says, when I look at you and compare you to everybody else in my kingdom, you're a lily among thorns. She says back to him, well, you know what, big, big guy, you're like an apple among the trees of the forest. Now, that doesn't mean much to you because you don't realize apple trees were extremely, extremely rare in that uh, area of the country. And so she was saying back to him, you may call me a lily among thorns. I'm telling you, you're like an apple tree that you never see, hardly, but it's there in the forest from time to time. That's how unique you are. So uh, you start to see that they are falling in love with each other. They like what they see. They think, uh, obviously, he says, man, your eyes are like doves. You're handsome. You're charming. Uh, you've got all these things going on for you. And uh, this relationship is going to the next level. Next, he comes up. It says, uh, here he comes, leaving across the mountains, bending over the hills. My lover is like a gazelle or a young stag. My lover spoke and said to me, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one. Come with me. The winter is past. The rains are gone. Flowers are appearing on the earth, and the season of singing has come. So what season is it? It is spring. That's when love comes, right? Well, love comes, but also uh, when you're together, and especially during this pandemic, we're together a whole lot. Uh, sometimes you have problems. All night long on my bed, I look for the one my heart loves. I look for him, but did not find him. I will get up now and go about the city through the streets and the squares. I will search for the one my heart loves. The watchmen found me as they made their rounds. Have you seen the one my heart loves? Scarcely had I passed them when I found the one my heart loves. I held him and would not let him go till I had brought him to my mother's house. So they're taking this relationship to a whole new level. And any of you who have ever taken your boyfriend or your girlfriend to your parents' house understand that this is a big deal. You uh, understand there's going to be a family vote whether they like them or not. You hope that if you like them, they will like them. But sometimes it doesn't work out that way. But you understand that you're saying to them, we're taking this to another level. Uh, this relationship is getting more serious if we're going to this. We're kind of in that pre-marriage phase, phase of uh, life. So uh, that's that's all going on. You see that uh, their, her absence uh, and his absence from her uh, it really bothers her. Uh, the way you tell if you really love someone sometimes is do you really miss them that much or is it just no big deal? And uh, so you start to see these signs that they really are truly falling in love. When we get to uh, not, not even hardly uh, toward the end of the chapter, we, they start talking about the wedding. And weddings, of course, in this day and this time for a king were going to be huge. Uh, They're going to be awesome. And, uh, you know, one of the fun things I have in my job is I get to do a lot of wedding ceremonies. And when I do those, I pretty well expect there's something that's going to go wrong. Uh, I have uh, people who... Uh, pass out during the the wedding ceremonies i have uh, one of my favorites was we had a unity candle that did not light uh in the ceremony and of course i hate unity candles anyway because they play really really long songs during them and you don't know what to do during the unity candle lighting but uh, the best part is when the unity candle does not light and i actually had this happen the uh, little cute couple tried to light it once twice, three times. It wasn't working. One of the groomsmen said, pass me the candle. I've got a knife. I'll cut the wax away from the wick. So we pick up the unity candle. While the song is going on, we move it all the way across the stage. This groomsman, I thought, had a little pocket knife, a little pen knife. He didn't have a little knife. He had a bowie knife, a huge, big old knife that he pulls out of his tux, which I do not know why he had to have a knife in his tux like that. But he did. So he starts hacking away at all this wax around the wick. And it's just a mess on stage. It looks like someone's been murdered up there with wax everywhere. And then he passes it back across the stage. And we get it back. And the little groom and bride start trying to light it again. And they try it two or three times. And it never lights. It will not go. And I'm thinking, oh, great. This is horrible. So the best I could do with that is, you know, I'm glad this happened because sometimes in life, things are not going to go exactly like you planned. 
Now, everyone else in the audience were all thinking, this marriage is not going to make it. They're going to be divorced by the time they get out of the parking lot uh, because the unity candle did not light. But uh, weddings are, are sometimes kind of wild just because you try to make such a big deal. But check out this wedding. Who is this coming from the desert like a column of smoke? They can see him off in the distance and columns of smoke coming. Look, it's Solomon's carriage escorted by 60 warriors. Now, I've had a few people uh, in some weddings from time to time. You might have 12 bridesmaids, 12 groomsmen. But man, 60, that's a bunch of people. And the noblest of all Israel, all of them wearing swords, all experienced in battle. King Solomon made for himself the carriage. So he made this, I mean, I don't know if he carved it out or put it together in the shop, but he he puts it together and it says, come out, you daughters of Zion, look at King Solomon wearing the crown. But this was a wedding that went right for sure. And it's a pretty incredible thing uh, when you get back and look at it. So you have uh, kind of the setup of this relationship happening. They're doing the things the right way. Uh, you'll see in uh, some of your readings as you go through Song of Solomon that it will say, do not awaken love before it desires. And it'll talk, uh, another little phrase that you'll see from time to time is, uh, watch out for the little foxes. And the little foxes were things that would go in and they would eat your uh, produce you're trying to grow or the fruit you're trying to grow. And it's talking about sexual activity prior to the commitment phase of this relationship. And so uh, watch for that as you read uh, through Song of Solomon. Look for those things that would be a problem but this is the setup for what Tommy Nelson will take you toward in the uh, wedding. Uh, this through the wedding, he'll take you into the honeymoon. Uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty incredible uh, and graphic. How chapter four is going to basically let you watch two people uh, undress in front of each other, make love to each other, and hold each other in their arms in a honeymoon. Uh, and it's all in the Bible, believe it or not. So uh, we'll let you uh, listen in to Tommy. Uh, hope you enjoy him. I'm sorry it doesn't have a uh, live uh, video where you can see him. It's just audio, but uh, that's the best I could do on uh, this YouTube channel. Anyway, take care. Bye-bye.